Welcome to Snowmobile Sessions Live on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. It's the number one destination to learn about snowmobiling, network with other sledders, and have an awesome time doing it. We'll meet other snowmobilers that share your passion and show your fan photos along the way. Snowmobile Sessions Live. Enjoy the ride. This episode of Snowmobile Sessions Live is brought to you by Energy Power Sports. They're Oakville's full-line BRP dealer with sales and service to all BRP models and so much more. Energy Power Sports always has the fun in store with a wide selection of clothing, parts, and accessories for all your power sports passions. Make Energy Power Sports your source for Can-Am off-road ATV and side-by-sides. Can-Am on-road Riker and Spider, including the Sporty F3S, Sea-Doo Watercraft and Switch pontoon boats and Alumacraft fishing boats powered by Mercury Marine. Put yourself on a Manitou pontoon or a widescape stand-up snowmobile. Energy Power Sports is the home for Lynx and Ski-Doo snowmobiles for the entire family. Do you feel the energy? Energy Power Sports, 879 Cranberry Court, Oakville, Ontario, or online, energypowersports.ca. Okay, we're here with uh, Doug Braswell from Taiga Motors. How are you doing, Doug? Gary, it is a good day to be visiting with you. How are you? <laughs> oh, excellent. I'm excited because Taiga Motors has been on my radar to have on this show since the first season, and now we're in season four. And uh, through a little bit of work and a little bit of luck, I got you on here. So thank you so much. Well, our mutual friends, uh, Kurt and Penny had a lot to do with this, and I'm sure glad that they were able to connect us. And I'm very uh, pleased to be able to share what Tyga has been up to and, and where Tyga is going with you today. Oh, for sure. I appreciate that. So um, how did how did Tyga come to be? I mean, uh, are, how, have you been there since the, the start or when did you join? Well, I, I can't say that I was there from the beginning. This uh, Tyga was was founded by three young guys uh, in university uh, at the uh, in, in Montreal and they were working together and they said, you know, what would be really cool if we electrified a snowmobile and they were like, ah, that's a dumb idea. You shouldn't be doing that. That's uh, electrifying a snowmobile is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. And they put their heads together. They had the determination and they came up with this big project that they came with to um, be a part of the uh, S SSCC or the, you know, the, um, the clean snowmobile uh, challenge. And then from there, they built another one, and they were able to uh, win an award, get some seed money, and and the the story just goes from there. And in the you know, in 2021, they were able to go public, um, which was uh, was a monumental thing for them. They were able to get the funding to be able to have the resources to start manufacturing, to get the engineers that they needed on board. And and so I joined them in 21, and I've been with them ever since. I I've done several things uh, with them. Uh, one of my Primary goals was uh, to start their OEM powertrain business. Uh, we had a little hiccup along the way uh, when we first started, and they needed someone to run their operations. So I I helped them uh, get their factory set up. I had some great people working with me from all cross sections of the earth uh, to put together the manufacturing facility. Now they've got uh, you know close to 350 employees. We've got a 120 square foot facility. Uh, as Sam mentioned today in our third quarter. Uh, results that uh, we're on our way to 75 units a day and, and we're able to consistently do that. Maybe more than That's you wanted to go in one sentence, uh, Gary, but uh, I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. excited when I tell you about uh, Tyga Motors. Well, that's the thing. And and you said like they, they had this idea and it was as, as harebrained and crazy as it sounds, it can't be easy to produce an electric snowmobile. It, you know, I, I've been in the snowmobile business for... 15, 16 years uh, professionally. I've been snowmobiling for the last 40 plus years and working on them, knowing them, engineering them, designing them, manufacturing them. It is no small feat to electrify a snowmobile. You know, those all three of these guys, they went to McGill. McGill is a premier school there in Montreal. And it's a, it's a heavy, heavy engineering school. And so these guys uh, just, just put their shoulders down and said, 
this is one of the hardest things that anyone's ever going to be able to do. And we're going to do it. And so it was Sam, Paul and Gab. They all got together and uh, they made it all come together. And, and when did the watercraft come into the picture? The watercraft was one of those that uh, kind of just a approached in a, in a very soft manner, but yet it was just the natural to go to uh, from the standpoint that when you understand how to seal a battery uh, from the elements, why not seal it from the rest of the elements on Earth? And so the watercraft was, uh, I'm not going to give you a date because I don't know exactly when, but we've been uh, yeah. bu building the watercraft since uh, 2022. And would you say the watercraft was in production as far as a, a scaled production um, vehicle before snowmobiles, or are they both kind of running the same course? They both ran at the same course. And when uh, 21, at the end of 21, we uh, ramped up to build snowmobiles. Right after that, after we built um, the snowmobiles that we had uh, reservations for and we had the ability to build and deliver, then we went right into the Orca Carbon, which was you know, a beautiful machine. It's all carbon fiber, both the hull and the deck. It's got the same powertrain in it as what the snowmobile does from an overall, when you think about the power unit, the battery, uh, the controls, it's uh, very, very similar. And it, and it just made sense. Yeah, it does. It does. I think with the clean water acts and everything else that's going on it, uh, that the, the Orca really is a, is a standout, I think, when it comes to something that you think makes, makes perfect sense in, in today's world. It's it's by far probably the leading the leading technology that's going to put more and more electrification into marine sports, whether you're in a boat, whether you're a pontoon, whether it's a, a personal watercraft. It, it just makes sense. And I, and I can tell you from my own uh, experiences of, of operating the Orca, both the carbon and the performance, it is uh, an experience that you you just have to have to be there to, to feel, to see, to hear. You know, the coolest thing about it is you can take off and it's just like a rocket coming off of the launch pad. You get to the point where you pull off the trigger and, and you stop and you can sit and you can visit with your friends. No noise, no sound, no nothing. It is, it is incredible uh, the way that the yeah. uh, watercraft works. I, I, we seen the snowmobile at the Toronto snowmobile show, Corey and I, uh, seen it and the, the girl was demonstrating it and it was neat. Cause I guess you got the exhibit at the last minute, the booth space, and it was this hallway basically. And she was able to reverse and forward in it. And it was so cool to get on it and power it up and not a sound. And she goes back and forth on the carpet and it's, you hear more of the ambient hall sound in my video than you do of anything else it was really cool in the sense that you, you know you start a snowmobile up and you hear it idling you hear it sitting there and and it's hard to have a conversation and here you go that you you can press a button and you're live and and uh and it's super quiet that that's the one of the great things about an electric uh, vehicle it, um, is the fact that when you when you start it there is no starting sound there is a, yeah. you know, audibles that come about, but when you get ready to, to drive away, whether it's your, and, and if you haven't reversed, there is an audible that uh, occurs as well, but the, the drive away is the amazing part. There's no, there's no rolling into a, a CVT. It's just nice, smooth deliberation of the, of the power right to the track. Very cool. Well, I'm going to say hi to some friends that are in the chat here. Uh, Dustin Ingram was first in the house. He says, how you doing, boys? Wisco Riders comes in second. Uh, LaPointe, skew 800 hours there. He said there's snow on the ground in Deep River. Uh, Jacob Masser, Burn is in there. That's a new name I haven't seen much. Outdoor Hobby Guy, another one. Uh, it goes on on. DP Rocks, that's my son. He's back in the house and he had a good time at Metallica this weekend. Adam Skinner says, how's it going, boys? Mike Gulit says uh, he doesn't know about the no sound thing. He doesn't know if people would want to hear him farting. You know, Dan Skovich, Keith 6360. <laughs> they probably would. Mark Godfrey says, hey, Gary. You know, uh, it goes on and on. So, and there's more people joining. I see that number <laughs> bumping up. So, <laughs> thanks everyone for tuning in. And uh, yeah, we're here with, uh, with Doug Browswell from uh, Taiga Motors. So now you, you get some skepticism out there. I, snow tracks just 
published a, a killer video and they did 160 kilometers that they recorded, but they actually drove more that they, they had to do in shooting that, that video and putting it together. And I thought it was amazing, you know, and they had really good things to say about it, but then you open up the comments and you know, you should never read comments, but uh, you know, you get the naysayers. What, where do you think Tyga positions themselves? I mean, right now it's not going to be for everybody. I get that. But, but where do you see Tyga um, fitting in the whole puzzle as today sees it? You know, Gary, I think you hit it right on the head is that it is not for everyone. And it is a, is a snowmobile that is meant to satisfy a range of new riders that are coming into the sport that are looking for a different experience. They're looking for the ability to be able to have a wide range of people uh, be able to operate it without a lot of in-depth knowledge. It's it's more intuitive. It's like, just think about someone that goes and gets in a car, whether you drive a BMW or you drive a Ford F-150, all the controls, everything's the same. And that's kind of where we are with our with our vehicle and the fact that it doesn't take a uh, a whole owner's manual and 15 minutes worth of studying it before you get on the machine and take off it's a snowmobile it's just powered a little yeah. differently you know it's like my good friend roger skyme told me he said doug what are we going to do next he said it's got two skis it's got a track it's got a seat it's got handlebars and it goes what's next and i told him i said roger the electrification of snowmobiles is what's next and he looked at me a little bit and had a big smile on his face and he said i know you guys are going to figure it out yeah. Well, I think you've been referred to as a Tesla of snowmobiles. And I, is that a compliment to you? Or do you, do you guys like that or not like that? I, I think that's just a generality of, of just overall EV. Uh, sure. Tesla is a, as a premier electric vehicle uh, supplier. We know that Tesla struggled a bit in the, when they started and, and they have a very flamboyant and yet very, uh, what I'll say, uh, action packed uh, leader and Elon. And, yep. and we, we kind of feel that uh, we, we have that same kind of nimbleness about us as well as that, you know, we have an idea, we're going to go for it, we're going to do it, and we're going to provide the, the information to our, our buying public as quick as possible and be able to give them product uh, that they're looking for. So yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a compliment to be referred to as the Tesla. Uh, however, yeah. um, we are a, a, a truly an electrified power sports company that is ready to change the world. Awesome. And and that's the thing. So Tesla takes a car that we all know of and they, they, they add, they action pack it with a lot of other things. So with, with your, now you've got the snowmobile kind of per, perfected as you, you see it, I think. Uh, do you see improvements in, in maybe automating suspension, automating drivetrain, like taking some of that, that Tesla philosophy where, Hey, we want to make the funnest car to drive and we want to make it out perform and out um, gadget everything else that out in the market. Yeah. Product plans are never revealed. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. Uh, but that, yeah. that's uh, the, the ability to advance a snowmobile um, beyond where we know it today might be limited. Uh, I've been, as I said, I've been in this game for a long time and I've seen a lot of things. I've tried a little, a lot of things and there's just a few ways to skin the cat. Is there ways to uh, improve it? You bet. Are there nuances yeah. or, um, what I want to say, um, subtleties that we can provide to the, uh, to the operator, to the driver, to the rider, however you want to, uh, look at it. Sure. Everyone's after it. All, all the manufacturers are trying to provide that last little thing and, and continue to keep advancing on that. Yeah. And I think that's the thing you, you, you have been in it so long that it's kind of a great head start, right? Uh, you know, it's, I am just absolutely, every day I come into work and I, and I look at, look at what we've done and step back and I go, okay, now look at the portfolio and here are the things that we want to do. It's just amazing that we're going to be able to pull these things off in the in this time frame that we've set ourselves for, based on what the others have uh, historically done. I mean, you, typically you it's forty eight month um, 
cycle time. I, and I say cycle time, but a 48 month program, just go from clean sheet to a, to a completely new vehicle. Sure. Can some of the uh, yeah. OEMs push it to 36? Can you push it to 24? Yeah. You, you've really got to have though a, a very long list of things that you've worked on and the incremental advancements are going to be pretty minimal versus what we've done with, with the Taiga product. Yeah. And, and saying that, I think when it first started, there was pieces that they used, they borrowed from other brands. I understand now that Taiga is completely Taiga. It's Taiga suspension. It's Taiga skid. It's, it's completely your product. Is that true? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's not any different than any other manufacturers. And I, I'm not going to take you back into the deep uh, alcoves of the where I came from, but I do know that we used a lot of different competitive snowmobiles to build snowmobiles. And so it's, it's just, uh, it just makes sense. And so do the car companies, they take all sorts of different components and they put them together and they test what's the, you know, considered world, uh, world-class, but all of the parts that you see on a Taiga snowmobile that are unique. And when I say unique, you know, we, we buy tracks, we buy, uh, shocks, we buy headlights, those kind of things. But the rest of the the snowmobile is 100% Taiga. Excellent. Now, it, getting parts, I mean, you mentioned it's for a rider that maybe wants to simplify the process and anybody can hop on this thing and have a good time. It, are parts readily available for these things? If someone does buy it and say they go out and hit a tree and break an A-arm, that type of thing? You know, that's one of the great things about the, the way that we are offering our product is that we are direct to the customer. We are looking at some different avenues, but we do have some very, very good TSPs, which is a Taiga service provider. And we do have the parts in stock. We have a X amount of uh, parts in our inventory so that we're able to satisfy any type of dilemma, delay, or uh, disruption that uh, the owner might have. But uh, sure we've got parts available and we can get them to them as fast, if not faster than the rest of the OEMs. Nice. Well, you've got a reputation to uphold, right? Exactly. So where, where do you, if someone wants a Tiger snowmobile, do, you, do they order it off your website or, or where do they go to get one? Do you have dealers set up now or is that something you're working on? We're still working on that aspect of it. We're, we're still a bit um, distant on that. I kind of give you a, a peek behind the curtain. It's nothing that we haven't already revealed uh, about what our uh, sales strategy is. But right now we're still at the direct customer um, purchasing arrangement. So if you want to buy a Taiga snowmobile, you can go on uh, our uh, website, www.taigamotors.com, and you can uh, put in your order. You'll get a uh, acknowledgement and then someone will get a hold of you within the next uh, 48 hours and, and uh, visit with you about when your delivery can take place. And how long does that schedule usually take? Is it, are they, are, are, do you have a backlog or, or is it something that you can deliver in a reasonable amount of time? Being that we're building ahead of the season, meaning, meaning that we are not gonna be in season, we're gonna be ahead of it. We're gonna be able to deliver when the customer wants that unit um, for his um, writing this, this winter. So. Excellent. Got a couple of questions popped up in the, in the chat there. Odie, the sled and car guy says, how does the temperature affect the range? Is it similar to electric vehicles? I bring that, uh, bring that comment back up. I see he is on a four stroke Arctic cat, man. You I got good eyes. That, I believe <laughs> that still has, that is one that uh, we put the 660 Suzuki mini car engine in. I'm, I'm glad to see you, Odie. That's thanks it. for the That's thanks it. for the question. You know, one of the things that uh, makes our battery system unique, and and there's no one's talking about this out there in the cold weather applications, is that we have a unique thermal management system that allows us to bring our battery up to temperature. Now, everyone talks about and thinks about lithium batteries, and everybody's got a little taste of different. Uh, What's, what's being put out there. But one thing that lithium batteries like is a stabilized operating temperature. And so our system has been designed so that we can quickly bring that up with very, very low amount of energy used so that we can stabilize the optimal temperature and you can get on your machine and take off and ride. I, I hope I, uh, I hope I over, uh, 
answered Odie's uh, question. Yeah, I think he did. That was really good. And then uh, Bill McCleary says, uh, recharge time and distance. What are you at now with that? William, that's that's a question that uh, we heard over and over again at the uh, Toronto uh, Snowmobile Show. There's, and it's a multiple level uh, response. And I, I, the majority of our recharging is done on a 220 uh, level uh, two type of uh, circuit. It's J1772, I believe. But I'll, let me start at the beginning. So we send our machines out with a wall charger. It's 110 volt. So you can plug that right into your, your charging port. And let's say you're down to 20% uh, uh, state of charge when you bring it in. By the time you get to get it plugged in and you get up in the morning, you're going to be up at that 98% of state of charge. So it's going to be somewhere around that 10, 11 hours. What we recommend to people that buy our snowmobiles is to put in, you know, it's it costs an average of around 700 bucks to put in a 240 socket. Uh, maybe you've already got one in your garage for your welder. Maybe you've got a remote utility room with a, with a 220 uh, dryer in it. But when you go to level two, when you go through that same, going from 20% up to that 98%, you're going to be somewhere around that two and a half hour charge. Now, if you go to a, um, let's see, an outdoor uh, charging position where they have DC uh, fast charging, they call it DCFC, where you're able to inrush that 600 volts, you're able to charge that uh, battery up with from 20 to 80% in about 40 minutes. Now, you ask about distance. That's the greatest question of all. It's kind of like, how far can I drive my Corvette at 170 miles an hour on 10 gallons of gas if I'm in Arizona? Or can I drive my Corvette at 50 miles an hour on that same distance and use less gas? Same thing with the snowmobile. It's all uh, influenced by your by your thumb. Uh, an average is going to be somewhere around that 65 to 70 kilometers. Uh, I've seen I've seen it down in the in the high high 50s all the way up into the 70s, and it's all about snow conditions. It's all about the way you're operating it. For the most part that's what you're going to see is that average of about a um, hundred kilometers of operation. I'm sure I got my terms mixed up. I'm sorry, uh, Gary, but uh, we, we advertise about a hundred kilometers of range. Nice. Now, does it go, if, if you're out in the trail and you're ripping along and all of a sudden it starts to, you know, go into panic mode, like I, I'm a drone operator. So when you, your battery gets dead, it goes smart and goes, I'm coming home. Is there anything that turns the the tie into limp mode to to conserve battery to get you extra distance? We do have a have a the ability to tell the operator that hey you are at a percentage of battery that is um, getting low, and then we are able to uh, reduce the amount of uh, energy that's being flowed to the uh, the power system. Uh, it's, it's like anything, you know, you can, you can push it just as long as you can. It's kind of like running, thinking you're going to get that extra 200, uh, 200 yards out of your uh, gas powered snowmobile. And you can see the gas station right there in your, in your eyes. And then all of a sudden you just run out of gas. So. <laughs> Do you have an average distance between stations at the moment in the Quebec trail system? Outdoor hobby guy asks. Outdoor hobby guy. That's a great, uh, great question. And I'm sorry that I don't have the actual app that I can bring up to you. But I know that uh, when we look at the way we map different uh, routes, we can go from charge station to charge station and have plenty of uh, reservoir from a state of charge uh, within that trail system in Quebec without any problem. Great. Corey Brock says, uh, do you have any way of using the sled as a self-generating battery charger? Or here, let me spin this around. If I'm riding a Taiga with Corey Brock on his XRS, can I get a generator on his track to charge me up if he, with the amount of spinning he does? <laughs> <laughs> well, Corey, I'm sorry to say that uh, I'm hearing you have to spin your track a lot. Uh, no, that's uh, that's a great question, and and we do have Regen built into our snowmobile, and what Regen means is that whenever you're descending a hill, we're able to uh, take some of that energy that uh, is providing resistance to the to the sled and then put it back in the battery. But as far as being able to use our battery to 
regen something else. We don't have that uh, right now. I know that uh, you know I, if the question is related to the way the Ford um, F-150 Lightning is, where they can power a house or something like that, we don't have that right now. Yeah, or the Dodge Ram Charger is uh, has a has a generator apparently built in that'll charge its own battery um, off the, but it's a gas engine that does that. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, no, no, it's, it's good. Uh, I want to uh, circle back to something we were talking about charging. You mentioned fast charging, getting up to 80%. I just watched Elon Musk explain that, that, that you don't think of the battery as, as a gas tank because a gas tank, you can fill right to the rim where he said electric batteries, they operate in a different way in that they fill up really fast until they get near full. And then the electrons are trying to find places to fit in the pack kind of thing is putting it in layman's term. So that last bit of charging is, is slower and harder to, to fill up, but it's not necessary. Is that, what's, is that your opinion on that as well? It's, it's just part of battery technology. Uh, whether it's the, whether it's a Tesla, whether it's a Ford uh, Mach E, whether it's uh, the Icon from uh, Hyundai, they all have the same operating type of um, battery systems, and it is there's, there's just so much energy that can be rushed into a battery as it's being managed, so that you you don't have any thermal events. You're able to manage the amount of temperature that's taking place within the system. And yeah. It's just part of today's battery technology. We, we're the same. When you get up around that 78, 79, 80% state of charge on DC, FC, it starts slowing down at the, at the charger and it's telling you that uh, you, can't, you can't take on anymore. You might as well yeah, go ahead yeah. and disconnect and, and move on. And ride it. So taking that to the next step, does it, does it, uh, Odie, the sliding car guy asked, does the Tyga have a GPS that will show you where charging stations are located, like the vehicles on the road today? Yeah. Our display will not provide that, but our app does. Nice. Yeah, that's the thing. Someone, uh, outdoor hobby side guy said it would be interested if you could get F the, snowmobile fmc fcmq uh to discount the pass on a taiga also use the app for trails that might be able to get in the pin charging stations right on the app so i think if you're into that though you'd know ahead of time where you're going yeah you know i i, I have to say that we work very very closely with all of the government agencies and especially the ones in, in uh, quebec is uh, to help uh, make it more accessible for electric vehicles as we all know that uh, Quebec is is the pioneer of all things electric and they and they promote it quite well and so we we work very closely with them and, and also other provincial areas as well and we're also working down in the United States with uh, you know into the Michigan into Minnesota Wisconsin those areas some out west might be a little more um, uh, challenged right now just because of the the mountainous regions, but uh, there's uh, there's a lot of activities taking place right now. There's a there's a big push from the uh, from what I'll say our our environmental groups uh, to add more charging stations throughout uh, the Western United States. Yeah, I can see that being a real environmental concern as you get into the mountains and and that type of thing. So, what walk me through the process of charging one? Uh, how do, how does it work? Is it a like a lid like a gas can tank has? And um, tell me how that is. There and, and everyone else that may not have seen it before. Oh, that's a great question. And and it's it's a flap that's a, that's positioned almost identical to where your gas cap would be on a on a traditional snowmobile. You lift the lift the cover up. There's a another protective cover that we lift uh, beyond that, and then you take your your uh, J1772 and and you plug it right in. We're either at uh, depending on the level of charger that you're at, uh, they just snap right in. It uh, communicates with the uh, with the charger. The charger then sends the communication back to the uh, operating system within the snowmobile and it says, okay, everything's ready to go. It uh, closes the contactors and it starts charging the battery. Nice. So it's simple. It's just like plugging a car in. It's, it's super simple. No, yeah. no special things needed at all. Sweet. 
I want to see you make make sure that you're not uh, not missing out on any questions here. So, um, no, that's excellent. Solid state battery. Someone asks, uh, can you talk a bit about what the battery is? Well, the the battery is made up of uh, lithium uh, ion pouches. We are using a pouch versus the the cell. Uh, we have our own unique um, uh, proprietary type of battery module that uh, we build in-house. Everything that we build at Taiga is vertically, vertically integrated. We've developed our own automation to stack all of our modules. The only thing that we buy for building our module is you know, the, the plastic parts, which are all our design. Uh, the cooling system is our design. We buy a pouch. There's only a few people on earth that, that make a uh, lithium ion pouch. We buy those uh, from overseas, but the rest of it is all uh, developed and designed. And we, we manufacture that all right there in LaSalle. And then um, our, our nominal battery voltage is 350 volts. Um, it's, it's plus or minus, you know, with any and all battery and battery cells, it, it all can fluctuate a little bit because it's, it's not an exact science, but it's very close. And that's why you have a, a battery management system uh, within your, within, within your system is so that you can, you can manage all those voltages so that you can optimize the, uh, the current and the, and the voltage that's being provided. That's a really thorough answer there. Does Taiga make like an MXZ model and then a Summit Freeride model? Like how, how many different models or, or varieties do you offer? <laughs> it, right now, uh, we are primarily focused on our utility vehicle, the Nomad. We do have a portfolio, and I'm sure that you've been able to see it, uh, Bobby, on our website of a crossover and of a mountain sled, which are both in, in still in development. We we felt that uh, bringing the utility sled, the the overall, uh, which which can be used as a family sled as well, whether it's a trail utility type of uh, snowmobile, was the most um, what I want to say wide range of appeal for the majority of snowmobilers sure there's going to be uh the the guys that are looking for the crossovers and also the mountain sleds and and i can uh, i can tell you that we're we're diligently working on those and hope to be able to share some things with uh, with our with our customers in the very near future right on uh what is the weight cory brock asks well the weight is always one that um from a snowmobiling manufacturer's uh, standpoint, it's always too much. Uh, <laughs> um, right now, our, our snowmobile, the the Nomad, the two up, uh, is roughly about 750 pounds, which is in line okay. with uh, with the uh, Yamaha VK Pro, uh, with some of the other uh, large four-stroke uh, utility sleds out there. So we're not too far off from a, a weight overall weight standpoint. One of the unique things about our snowmobile is that the way our battery and our tractive unit or the motor is all placed within the sled is that we've done a very good job of balancing it. So you don't realize that you are sitting on top of a battery. You know, the majority of people have got this gas tank that they've got their legs straddled around. Uh, from, a, from a Tiger standpoint, you're sitting on our battery. And so we've got a, a really good balance for uh, an overall sled um, ride neat here's the most important question from wade 57 are you ready i'm ready will wade do will it do a wheelie <laughs> ah wade well if you're up going up the right hill you take your limiter straps off and you pull like crazy you might get her to pull a wheelie but I'm not going to tell you that doing a wheelie on a utility sled is the uh, the ultimate uh, thing to to mark my uh, spot on. No, it's it's yeah, it's well, really a, it's a wonderful. Uh, it has a it has a lot of power. Uh, if you get the uh, the performance model, you can get the range, sport, and wild mode. So you get to experience those three different modes, and with each one of those modes, also influences you know just how much uh, energy you use. Uh, when you're when you're riding but uh do a dead and stop wheelie on the flat mm, don't think we're going to do that yeah so is traction an issue like i imagine the torque it's a 
it's a completely linear, like flat power band. Like it's on like an electric vehicle is, is traction an issue? No, traction is not an issue. We're using a Camelplast 1.6 um, uh, Cobra track with the ice rippers uh, installed in it. The nice. way that we've developed our uh, algorithm for throttle input allows you to not just pour all the power to it at once so that you just don't dig a deep trench. It allows you to uh, progressively apply the power so that you're able to lift and get out of the way and, and uh, keep moving. Great. Uh, a couple of comments. Kirk and Penny, we ride 700 pound utility sleds in Newfoundland with no issue. Uh, Masser says that a 23 XRS Renegade with smart shocks fully loaded and full of fluids is 650 pounds. So you're right. You're not too far off and that's a two stroke, right? How does yeah. the drivetrain work? Uh, Corey wants to know. This is a great one. Is it CBT direct drive? We do a direct drive when, and, and I want to, uh, qualify what direct drive means. A lot of people think, well, it's the, you know, the, the power unit or attractive unit goes directly to the track and it does, but it goes through a reduction, a, a gear reduction. It's a positive displacement or positive drive belt. Similar to like what you see on a, on a top fuel or a funny car that runs the blower off the, off the crankshaft. It's that type of belt. It's similar to like what Polaris has on their, uh, their RMKs. It's similar to like what uh, Arctic Cat has just released on their um, Catalyst. It's, it's a belt drive, but it is direct. We do not run through a CVT. Great. Uh, Bill McCleary says it sounds like perfect for larger lodges like Deerhurst and Huntsville uh, for shorter trips by guests. I think there is definitely a market there. And is that is that where you're sitting right now? Are you getting more um, passionate snowmobilers like myself ordering these things? We're, we're seeing a, a, a mixture of everyone there, Gary, and that, yes, we understand that uh, there's some areas that don't have their charging infrastructure as well suited as what we have in Montreal or in, in the, just overall Quebec. Um, but we believe that once a person experiences the electric snowmobile and the simple way of having to charge it and, and the, what you have to plan for when you charge, it, it, it makes it all part of the experience. You know, I, I think of so many times when I've been up in the UP and we rock it down the trail and we burn 10 gallons of gas and nothing flat. We have to get in the gas station, we fill it up, but we have to wait for 30 minutes because there's a long line. It's not a, and then, so when we're waiting in this long line, we're, we're getting coffees, we're getting something to eat, we're, we're talking with people around. So, you know, before you know it, we've already spent an hour there just getting our 10 gallons worth of gas and with the same type of ideas that you plug in and in about 45 minutes you get you get charged back up and you're ready to go again yeah hey i can tell you and everybody in the chat a lot of the people there last year can relate to that one hour at the gas station because we did it up in sudbury <laughs> yeah we could have we could have actually uh, been charging an electric before we filled up everybody else's snowmobiles because there was, I think, 20 of us trying to fill up. We drained the, yeah, Wisco's laughing. We drained the uh, the gas station right out of fuel that day. So there you go. There's some talk about maintenance, and, and that's one thing that's on my mind as well. Has there been any um, any studies done showing, like, the cost of ownership of a, of a Taiga compared to a gas-powered machine? We have done some studies, and it's predominantly – excuse me, predominantly been focused on your commercial user, your ski hill uh, guy where he's got, you know, he's got a controlled environment. He knows how many uh, ups and down the hills he does a day. He knows how much gas he burns. Um, but what I can tell you about maintenance is our snowmobile is maintenance free when it comes to having to do anything with the, with the tractive unit or the power head, with the belt drive. It's not any different when you, uh, with your regular snowmobile, when it comes to your track, you know, you, you lift it up in the summertime, you take a little tension off of it. Other than that, you put it in your shed, you put a cover on it, you're done for, you, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. There doesn't have to be anything done with the coolant. There doesn't have to be anything done with the motor. It's completely uh, maintenance free. Yeah, like greasing the skid's still going to be a thing, I guess, right? Any 
any moving joint or are they? We still have grease fittings, no doubt. Um, yeah, yeah. Any anything that has to do with the with the suspension? Um, did I lose? Oh, okay, I just lost. <laughs> But we we uh, we tout our vehicle as as close to being as maintenance free as possible. Um, you just can't get around put a little grease in the get in the skid frame, get that old uh, water pushed out, and and uh, get the uh, get it ready for a, a nice uh, storage th through the summer and be ready to uh, go when uh, when the snow flies. And and in storage mode, like in the summer when it's parked, do you have to keep it on a trickle charger or can you just leave it unplugged and, and just charge it up before you ride in the, uh, in the winter again? It's funny. Corey was thinking the same thing. Trickle charger in the summer. <laughs> no trickle charging. In fact, uh, what we recommend is to uh, put it on the charger before you, uh, before you put it in storage, unplug it and you might lose, um, you know, maybe a couple of percent over the summer. And that's just the, um, you know, the, differentiation between the the cells uh, working but uh, for the most part no you don't have to do anything you put it away at uh, right. at 75 percent charge you're going to go out there in uh, five or six months and it's going to be at uh, no no less than 70. great are, are there are, are there creature comforts somebody was making a joke about a seat warmer but are there creature comforts on Tyga that make make that experience of that snowmobile a little bit better? I will say that we have a really, really good windshield. Um, it does a phenomenal job of keeping the weather off of you, the wind off of you. Um, we do have some excellent hand warmers. Uh, as you can imagine, having electric hand warmers on electric snowmobile, you'd expect them to work really well. As far as an electric seat, um, no, no, we don't have an electric uh, heated seat. Yeah, for sure. Like, that's the thing. It's like uh, someone commented about your headlights and you do have LED headlights in them. It's a really, we're going to get to some pictures in a, in a moment, but it's a really nice looking package when you see that. Your designers, they're all, I take it they're all in-house. I mean, this started on the ground with just a few people, but tell us about your, your design team start to finish. You know, it's... Uh young group of guys lots of fresh ideas a lot of understanding what's out there from a industrial design world uh, we believe that uh, our industrial designers are, are some of the best uh, in that montreal uh, quebec area and they've and they've led us down a, a very promising path for styling uh, we believe that we have a style that's going to be uh, long lasting we won't have to go in and do a lot of major changes uh, throughout the years you know everyone has the the, uh, the year that they got to do the bold new graphics and those kind of things. And sure, we'll probably end up there as well at some point. But right now being new with a, with a very, I'll say, exciting styling, uh, it's, not, it's not too radical, but yet it's not too um, old school, I'll say. Uh, it, it, it appeals to a broad market. Yeah, for sure. How how does the, using something like battery the hand warmers um, impact the the range or did you when you test the range of the battery and give those specs are you are you figuring people running hand warmers? We use we use it in both ways. Uh, you know the the hand warmers do work quite well, and even in the coldest days you'll find yourself turning them off because you do have good protection from the, from the windshield. And it, uh, they do uh, warm up quite well. Yeah, excellent. And one of the, with the big, all the talk is, and it doesn't matter what brand you're, you're, you're talking about, it's all in the gauge and who's got the best gauge. And your gauge is really neat. Um, do you, do you uh, want to talk a bit about your, uh, your, your gauge, your dash? Yeah. It, I think you hit it right on the head, Gary. It's, it's one of those evolutions of, who's got the coolest and who can do it the fastest. And one of the things that I'll tell you about our, our gauge, our, our dash display is that that was all designed in-house uh, by Tyga uh, electronic engineers. And so we're, we're continually able to monitor and modify and upgrade it uh, over the air uh, as, as we go along. So if, if a, a uh, customer has a sled and then we need to make an upgrade to it and we find some things that 
make it a more appealing ride or more information can be shared, we're able to push that uh, over the air and and the uh, the customer will eventually or immediately be able to see that. When, when we talk about gauges, I and I'm not going to get into the details of it because it's there's there's so many things that uh, can take place on a on a gauge, and I th I think that the things that are the most and most um, relevant to a to a rider is can I see how fast I'm going, can I see how much energy I have left, and the um, where my my settings are for my snowmobile and if those are quick glances where you don't have to uh, take your eyes off the trail and you're able to to maintain your your riding that's the best gauge there is the gauge that you have to stop and you have to uh, figure out 16 button pushes to get to where you want to be um, personally i'm not into that i want to be able to tell yeah. how fast i'm going where my my machines being set at and uh what's what uh what's going on with the sled in a moment's glance. I'm not sure if it was the Tiger. Does it change color as the battery goes down? Is that, is that how it works? Our, our no. color change, our color changes when you go from uh, startup mode to drive mode. Okay. That's what it was. Okay. I remember seeing that at the show. It was a, it was pretty neat looking. And we're going to see some photos of that too. Um, how many charging stations have you got? up there off trail um that that's a question that i think you answered earlier um the, the dominator just came in he's a little late late to the show tonight but uh yeah it wouldn't have any off trail it's uh lodges are starting to get into that yeah and and i i would love to be able to give you a specific number um i just can't i don't know that number right off the top of my head i know that uh you can go to was it uh, Charge Canada? Uh, there's a couple other sites that um, go to Hydro Quebec, and they can and they can tell you exactly where the charging stations are. I apologize, I I don't know that information. Oh, that's that's fine. Um, Kirk and Penny says, what's the direction Taiga is going with suspension? He noticed Montreal-based Alka shocks on some of the Taiga displays. We have a we're just like everyone else. We uh, we worked with uh, with an initial supplier of, of uh, suspension components. Elka happened to be uh, a Quebec supplier. Uh, was easy to work with, and they were they were quick to respond. Uh, there's several others out there that would like to be working with us. We also have a uh, a suspension provider, uh, coilover shocks and and uh, monotube shock absorbers that are based out of uh, Taiwan that we've uh, developed uh, with. Um, years of experience from our competitors that uh, have helped as well. So um, I wish I could give you a, a real good answer for what, what's next, but I can tell you that there is something next coming for our uh, suspension. And we're, and we're just like everyone else. We're, we're always looking to improve the ride to, to see where we can um, put those comforts in place and still be able to have the, the rideability of the snowmobile that the, the rider's looking for. Nice. I think it was your owner was just talking in one of the videos. I believe it's on your Instagram page. And he was mentioning about the, sus the suspension and how you, it's not weighted like a traditional sled. And you don't even notice the weight of the battery or anything when you're on it because of the ratio that they use for our, for real rear to forward. That's a little bit of what I was mentioning earlier, Gary, the way we've got the sled balanced from the front, the center shock and to the rear shock. And because of the way the battery's placed on it, we've been able to really dial that in so that it doesn't give you the, the sensation or the idea that the snowmobile is not the way a snowmobile should, should feel. Yeah. Now, were you involved in this, in this snow tracks uh, video shoot? Or is that a, is someone else at your company that that set that all up? There was there was someone else within the uh, the business uh, from our marketing team that uh, worked with uh, the snow tracks guys. I I was just just be curious what your has word got around your shop as far as, as what their reaction was, what they're saying about the Taiga aside from what what we've seen in the video edited up. 
it's pretty fresh uh, with it coming out just over the weekend. There's been some posts that uh, are coming up. Uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, to talk to the Lesters yet on uh, anything that they're getting internally, but I do know that uh, when those guys uh, put together a video, it usually produces some pretty uh, stellar results. Yeah, they seem to really like it. Like it's it's uh, and it seemed to be very genuine uh, what they're saying. And again, they're not sponsored by Tyga. Um, they're sponsored by other big brands and it's, it was nice to see an honest opinion like that. Yeah. Um, they, they, uh, they did enjoy our, our, uh, snowmobile. <laughs> uh, going back a bit in the chat, cause you, you were talking about the suspension. Uh, what about the aftermarket parts, carbides, idler wheels? Uh, will those specs be available, uh, with, you know, same manufacturers, let's say Kim Pex or, or Woody's or, or fast track traction or, or Koala pieces, um, or would we, everybody, would you need to buy them from Tiger right now? Being that I am a, a good company, man, I'll say, I'd like for you to buy them all from us, but uh, it won't take long before uh, where the, where the customer can see where they can buy their carbides for the skis. They'll be able to find the wheels if they need wheels, uh, high facts and those kind of things in the aftermarket will, will live. Uh, there's, there's no secrets out there. Okay. So we'll, we'll be easier. Like that's, I think the, if I, you dig deep enough down into that question, I think the real question is, is it easy to get parts for these things? You know, it, it is easy to get parts. Yeah. Are, are there options? What so Corey says? What's the cost? And uh, we'll start with that one. Roughly, what what's the MSRP on one of these things? I'm not going to provide that, Gary. Uh, it's listed on our website, and I don't want to give anybody uh, the wrong information, and especially uh, that we're visiting with both uh, Canadian and U.S. based people. So I, I would recommend that uh, you go to our website. And that uh, that the value or the the retail price is there. Is it tigamotors.com? Yes. Here, I'll just uh, post that up here so that people can see it. I'll double check. Just like that. I think that's what it is. I was yeah, on there today. And tigamotors.com. Are, are, are there track options as far as the track lug sizes? The um, that type of thing. Are there, is there options right now to pick and choose what shocks you want? So if you want like a standard shock or if you want an Elka or, you know, anything in between. Yeah. There is the option to be able to choose uh, your suspension packages. Tracks are uh, the same throughout. Um, not a lot of options or packages that you can choose from other than suspension upgrades or uh, standard Okay, no problem. Well, that's saying you do if you're doing something right, you just you don't want to deviate too far off of that, right? Why? Uh, it's it's we want to get the feedback from the customer. Um, I find that, um, and a lot of OEMs will, will say this too. Without uh, under, they'll have to say it undercover. I'll say it in public that when you offer too many options, you tend to spread yourself so thin that you don't know which end's coming and going. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going to give you a break for a minute. Um, you want to go into some fan photos. We got a couple from the, the usual fans and then we'll get into some pictures of yours and we'll keep talking about your product. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Fan photos are brought to Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Track Snowmobile Traction Products. Check out fasttrack.co. And don't forget if you uh, order your fast track studs and you can uh, put your studs, your back as your nuts in the cart, and then you, uh, you add a toolkit in there and you use a coupon code snow and uh, that toolkit is absolutely free. It's a $35 value and you can get that at fasttrack.co. There's no K in track. 
F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C dot C-O. Here we go. And then we're off to the, uh, the, the fan photos. So we're, uh, we're kicking butt on this sportsman lodge thing, Doug, we've got to, we get, you're welcome to come with your tigers as well. We've got a uh, family day weekend, $450 Canadian per person. It's February 16th to 19th. That's family day weekend, 2024 includes, I'm just trying to get out of the way, home cook, uh, breakfast and dinner daily and uh it's a lot of fun and we're smashing the attendance from last year and uh, there's a few rooms left in the tower so if you're on the fence on this thing get me an email right away gary at mudbrats.com because uh it's it's amazing how uh the reception we're getting on this and i'm getting people saying we just watched that uh you know the the video series from last year whether you're on mike gleet's channel or mine and uh, it's selling them on it, that's for sure. So uh, it's going to be a hoot. We'll talk more on the Sportsman Lodge, but uh, we got we're going to have a good crew out there. And Corey and Gary's amazing poker run, first annual or inaugural. <laughs> it's going to be a good time. Have you ever been up to the Sportsman Lodge? Are you asking me, Gary? Yeah, yeah. I. I don't think it's so. Su it's near Sudbury. It's it's amazing. It's a rustic I, cabin, uh, lodge cabin type thing, all wood, floors creaking, and Jim's a great guy. He's the owner there. Yeah, it's uh, it's an amazing place, an amazing experience. <laughs> I'm looking forward have, to it. I'm I have really, been to Sudbury, really... I have been to Sudbury, but it was in the summertime. Yeah, cool. So uh, Wisco Sledhead sent sent this in. And I think I've lost my, uh, my, my text on this. Hold on. I just got to call up my email here, but he said something like damn skidoos. And, uh, there he goes. He said another weekend wrenching with mass art proper way to work on a rust belt skidoo or rust butt skidoo, uh, bucket skidoo. Let the sparks fly. And who said removing a track is hard. It took about 10 <laughs> seconds. He said, <laughs> And then uh, Massart said, there's something missing here. He's uh, he sent in these pics and he said, uh, the first one, another week of a new project and full restoration in progress on his uh, new 583 MXZ he got. And then he went and he updated the, uh, the Skidoo 10.25 inch gauge on the Renegade. And he said he was halfway through and it asked him if he wanted to recalculate, LOL. <laughs> That's our running joke with the GPS. So that was Jacob. Thanks guys for sending it in. Listen, if you don't want to see just Jacob and Wisco sending in photos every week, you got to make sure you send them to me. Fan photo at mudbrats.com. If you're catching this podcast in the car, uh, you can send them to me anytime during the week. You can send them uh, right up on through until Monday at noon on uh, show day. And then we'll make sure we get you on. If we can't, we'll get you on the next week. It's pretty, it's a pretty simple process. So fan photo at mudbrats.com. And we'll, uh, we'll show your pictures and send some preseason stuff. Let us show us what you're doing right now on your sled projects and even send us your toy haulers. Uh, a lot of people working on their trailers right now. Send us some of those, but, uh, you got her there. So now we're going to get into some Tyga shots here. So it'll bring some new questions and, and comments here. So I really like this. I pulled this off the internet and it says Tyga was born to electrify the challenging off-road vehicle segment, redefining outdoor exploration without compromise across the waters of the world, trails or mountains. Is that a pretty accurate statement, Doug? Very accurate. Uh, a lot of words there, uh, Gary, to say that uh, we believe that there's a cleaner way to impact our environment and to still enjoy the outdoor recreations that we do uh, today with, uh, with gas-powered machines. Right on. And I'm going to step on the elephant in the room here. And, um, you know, you see, see people saying, well, electric's not clean because of blah, blah, blah. What, what, do, you what do you say to that? 
it's it's all it's all about the energy equation and and yes um it takes energy to extract the minerals from the earth and to move them and to process them and do this and do that but it's the same with oil and gas um electrical vehicles electric vehicles are so much more efficient you, you look at uh, a gas and you know, i think it's maybe 27 28 percent efficient uh, when you think about converting gasoline in, into uh, in energy for moving a snowmobile or for that matter anything so it's um we have to step back and we'd have to say let's let's look at the energy equation just a little closer and i think when i when i people ask me that too i think of you know, putting two-stroke or four-stroke fumes down in, the so uh, down in the snow. I'm not putting them out in the air. I'm removing all of the uh, the sound uh, that's uh, associated. I, I'm just I'm turning a new experience into snowmobiling. I know that's that's kind of hard to believe. The guy yeah. that's been on a snowmobile for 40 plus years is going to say, "Hey, there's a new way to ride a snowmobile," and it there really is. And it's it's highly enjoyable, and I encourage everyone that uh, is on our podcast today to uh, to seek out a Taiga um, demo, or find a friend that has one, or a lodge that has one, and take it for a rip. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I'd love to try one. I think it's uh, um, you know it's the same thing that Henry Ford went through when he invented the automobile. You know, people didn't want to give up their horses. And look at where we are now. How many horses you see on the road? <laughs> Not many. Yeah, I didn't go. I didn't go to work on a horse today. That's for sure. <laughs> so we. You know, I got a couple your, pictures. Yeah, you know, the shot behind you. That's a that's a photo of our uh, Orca carbon. That's a, a carbon uh, fiber deck and hull. Uh, it's got the same powertrain as what the snowmobile has in it. It's just laid out in a little different arrangement, uh, but the controls, uh, the display, the tractive unit, all of that is uh, essentially the same as you'll find in the snowmobile. Nice. So your, your economy is a scale using as many cross it over parts that you can. Uh, yeah. What's a performance like on these watercraft? Mind blowing. That's all I can say. It's mind blowing. Is it really? Is, is it is comparable? Got, it's got the pull of a, it's got the pull of a, the, it's, it's just hard to explain the, the amount of thrust that you feel instantaneously on this. It's like, you're going to like the thing's going to hop out of the water when you pull on it that hard. <laughs> and then when you go to a range mode or the performance mode and you're just motoring around in the water, it's, it's just, it's a whole different experience. That's cool. Like, it, are they learning some things from this that they can apply to snowmobiles and vice versa? Oh, of course. Yeah. Do, do you have any any examples, particularly? Mm, it, the majority of it all has to do with um, the controls, the the algorithms that can tr that control the the operation of the machine. Um, you know, just just the way that. Um, the power is applied. Yeah. Can't give sweet. you too many secrets. No, exactly. Exactly. And here's something I thought I, I included because I thought people might find it interesting. Uh, each Taiga includes a level one charging connector capable of plugging into a standard wall, uh, 110 volt outlet. Uh, to maximize the 6.6 .6 kilowatt charging rate, we recommend installing a level two charging system. Uh, level one, it says approximately 14 hours residential. Uh, level two charging residential commercial, approximately three and a half hours. And level three is 40 minutes. So level three is what you'd find at a supercharger, correct? That's correct. And and those are very conservative numbers um, that you that we've got on our website. Um, typical, you can you can get charged back up at the level two in about two and a half hours uh, so that you can go out for a for a full ride. Yeah. Sweet. And there's, there's a good look at it, you know, with the led headlights and it's a, it's a pretty aggressive looking machine. And here's a shot of this, the, the gauge, which is the same as on the snowmobile, um, on the Orca. That's so correct. You can see you've got, you've got your speed on the, on the right, I guess it is your RPM. Would it be, what, what would be on the, 
Would that be your your uh, your burn rate? Is it? Well, on the right, the that RPM. is. Yeah. Well, on the right there, Gary, that's your energy that you're either using or the energy that you're putting into it when you're charging. You've got your uh, your speed in the center, and I the RPM would be what the what the tractive unit's turning. Oh, okay. So that would be the RPM of the actual uh, drive on it. Mm -hmm. Would it? Right on. Yes. And then that bar at the bottom, that's your, that would be the battery level. It says 80 on it. So this that's the state of 80%. charge. That's the percentage of state of charge. Cool. Very neat. And then this is, this is showing the tie at work. You've got it up on a ski hill. How many, uh, how many, uh, like mountain resorts and that type of thing have adopted this technology. Those numbers aren't ones that we share a lot, Gary, but I can tell you that yeah. the, uh, the majority of um, ski resorts across uh, Quebec, Ontario, and you get on into the Rockies of the United States are all uh, uh, fast adopters. And is it mainly because of the sound disturbance or what other advantages do they see with the Taiga? It's, it, if you think about people that enjoy to ski, they're uh, very ecologically uh, minded. They, they like the idea that uh, there's not a pollutant being put out on the, on the mountainside. Uh, what we find is the majority of people that uh, do uh, ski these days are, are adapting to electric vehicles, whether it's uh, a Tesla or a Rivian, Mach-E, Lightning, whatever it might yeah. be. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's much more friendlier to operate around people that aren't around snowmobiles in a in a day to day type of basis. It's just it's kind of like a, a very silent um, vehicle that goes past you. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good discussion there about uh, the gauge looks fly. Outdoor hobby guy says, um, is there any any? Uh, I mean, there's always work being done, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but is there any uh, advancements that you see in getting that range from say 160 kilometers to 250 or more? Every day there's a new advancement being made on battery technology and battery technology is the key to um, increased extended uh, range. Uh, the car companies all have the same uh, issues today um, sure, there's um, things that you want to do to improve the efficiencies of your drivetrain. There's things you want to improve about your uh, undercarriage, your rolling, uh, you know, the skis, the, the whole bit. But uh, probably the biggest advancement that's coming uh, along the way will be the uh, introduction of solid state batteries of different uh, levels to increase that um, power density uh, for the amount of uh, payload that you have. Very cool. And I like, uh, there's a lot of photos here that show the, the taiga at work, you know, here we're putting, um, a tow and a sleigh behind it and filling it full of firewood. Uh, as far as the workability of one of these machines it, it is, is electric a, an advantage because of the, the unlimited torque and, and massive power you have at the throttle. It's, that that does play into it but the the whole um secret behind a, a utility vehicle especially when you're towing things is being able to apply that power in a very um i'll say methodical and calculated manner so that you don't have to slip a belt or engage a cvt you know our towing capacity is roughly about 1125 pounds um so it's it's equivalent to any and all utility sleds and it and it does tow very well just from the standpoint that it the throttle engagement is so smooth yeah i noticed that at the show too she creeped along ever so slow it was uh it was pretty incredible and and not like a cvt clutch where you know you think about it jerking as you're going um she was able to just go and ever so slowly move back and crawl back and forth without any issues it's a very good point. And here we are. It's the, the photo here is the, the, uh, the Taiga towing a groomer, uh, towing a dredge, which actually would take a lot of, uh, of 
what you'd think of BU Torque to actually pull that along. Yeah. This application is probably one of the more um, rigorous, I'll say. Um, you're just, it's just like anything you've, um, you just have to put more energy into it and it'll, um, it'll use the energy pretty quick. Yeah, but it, it, it'll work though. It's like, that's mm -hmm. the thing. This isn't, uh, this is a workhorse sled. It's not, it's not a toy. And I, I threw this one in here for the snowmobilers. It's a, it's an orca out on the water in a, in a snowstorm. Yeah. This, uh, this photo was taken last year on the St. Lawrence river. One of our, uh, test guys was out, uh, doing some last minute, uh, data gathering and it was, uh, it was pretty cool. That's very neat. Is, is like, as far as the cold weather goes, um, as you know, you've got the Orca, which is going to run in super hot and you've got the snowmobile and, you know, here we are in Quebec and it's unbelievably cold in Quebec. Uh, is it fairly consistent condition wise running like that? Or would you find if it was near zero or minus five that you'd have a better experience on, on a, on a Taiga than, than say if it was minus 25? I don't think you're going to find a, a great difference whether in the temperature uh, because of our our thermal management system and the way that we maintain our um, our battery our battery discharge and charging uh, throughout the system. So it's like I've told a lot of people, it's the only thing that it's a snowmobile and it, it operates like a snowmobile. It looks like a snowmobile. It just has a little different powertrain and a little different way of getting you around. That's cool. Where where can people uh, get on these things as far as demo riding and and things like that? Do you publish uh, group rides like that or or places you can go and test drive them? Yep, we do have a uh, a section of our website that does um, list out where the next uh, demo uh, rides will will take place. I'm not sure exactly uh, how far out our um, our demo people have got those done, but I do know that there's going to be an extensive amount of uh, demo rides done this winter. Yeah, very cool. And this app was something I really liked. And I mean, this is the this is the Watercraft app. Um, is do they have something like this for snowmobiles? And how does it work? Well, I can tell you that it's also for the snowmobile. But how it works, that is beyond me. I, <laughs> all, all I can tell you is that we've got an app now that uh, is based in the cloud. And we can do, as from an owner's standpoint, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. You know, from us looking at the state of the charge, you can look at uh, the health of the, of, the, of the machine. Other than that, I know nothing more about it. Do, would, you, would you know if, if you actually charge this, let's say you go into a, a restaurant to have dinner and you charge your sled, is this app something you'd pull out and go, oh, I'm at this one here says 87% charge. Um, Absolutely. Is that yeah. how, is that how it's supposed to work? Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And I, and I found this, uh, oh, my, my camera might be dying. Hold on. Um, it won't take me long to plug in. It died last week on me too. And I don't want that to happen again this week. It only take me a second to get back up. There we go. There we Gary, go. The picture, I'm back. The, the picture you're showing me, I have no idea. I. <laughs> the, it says it says sound emission emitter none two stroke or four stroke. It has a checkbox. This was a Tyga April Fool's joke. <laughs> This is what what you guys put out on April Fools. No. What which I love it. You know. <laughs> People want that two stroke or four stroke sound. There there we go. I thought that was kind of cool. And fun. It doesn't exist. Again, April Fools. And uh and this is one of your rides here. So how are they structured uh, as far as the the Taiga events, do you need to pre-register or do you need to have a deposit down on one of the units in order to drive one? All of our demos are uh, free of charge. Uh, you do need to um, 
to uh, pre-register. It, it does help if you happen to know where the uh, the demo is going to take place. There's nothing that says you can't uh, show up and say, I'd like to, to fill in the next spot that's available or, or they'll work you in. Nice. So they're pr pretty opening to get uh, as many people to try this thing as they possibly can. Yes. And it's it's no secret other manufacturers are out there uh, with BRP coming out with their their own version of electric snowmobile. That that's got to be a good thing in the industry to have more players in it, does it? Anytime that we can increase the uh, the notoriety and the available options and uh, selections for people to uh, join the snowmobile community is a, is a good thing. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's what I think as well. You know. Um, now this is cool. Your factory, how how big is it? Like how many people do you employ in it? And I mean, this is a shot of a water test tank. You've got an orca being lowered into into this all water tank. Orcas, all of our orcas go through a a water test uh, where we test the the jet pump, we test the thermal unit, we also check to make sure that there's no uh, water ingress, and then we uh, we we take it out of the tank and everyone is 100% tested uh, from the orca standpoint from a uh, snowmobile standpoint they all get uh, the track turned over on them so that we uh, test those uh, power units and the control system as well we have roughly uh, 170 people in our manufacturing facility uh, that includes uh, you know not only our assemblers but our a support staff from a manufacturing engineering, industrial engineering, and also uh, from an automation standpoint. Yeah, very neat. And here we've got a couple of uh, Tiger snowmobiles up on a sled deck. And and that's something that I, I think years ago when they first started talking about them, they they did talk more about the mountain and the, and the off-trail segment. They've gone kind of more uh the the workhorse model now but you said you they'll we'll see some uh some advancements in the other areas in the near future yeah, yeah it's just the progression of what uh what makes best business sense at, at the time yeah and I, I i don't know is this an old photo of one of the uh prototypes it is it's it's one yeah. of the early on um of course, it's a staged photo, but uh, no doubt yeah, yeah, uh, you can yeah. you get a little air on a on a tiger with uh, without much problem. Yeah, nice. Well, that's the thing. I've seen videos of them running, and it's it's pretty. Like you said, it's a snowmobile. It seems to perform like a snowmobile even in deep snow, and and uh, it there just isn't the sound. You hear the track and and the the idler wheels and the snow going by, but you don't really hear much else. And this is a shot from a, a photo op that we did in uh, downtown Montreal, just to uh, get a uh, get some different uh, perspectives. I love that. It it really shocked the world. I actually seen it on the news, um, the uh, CTV uh, Global News, or one of them had it on there that uh, you had it parked down there, plugged into an EV charger right downtown. This shot here is great with the lady drinking her coffee and the sled sitting there in the parking lot or in the parking spot in the main street with the charger plugged in downtown Quebec. <laughs> uh, Outdoor Hobby Guy says, uh, Quebec government's talking about not allowing the sale of gas cars starting in 2030. Have you heard anything like this from the snowmobile standpoint? Or power no. sports as it may be? No? Okay. Good to know. I mean, that's that's the the. the I think it it kind of spins back and and people say that anything electric. It doesn't matter if you're talking electric snowmobiles or or electric motorcycles or watercraft. That it's a government agenda and not real. You know, like people don't think that this is a private company. I mean, it started by like you said, guys in in university. What's your take on that? When when people come up with those, that it's propaganda. You know, what's your take on that? Everybody has a conspiracy. Everybody has a has an idea. Um, I think the easiest thing to um, to go back to is the uh, our, our mission statement is that we want to electrify the power sports industry and provide a a cleaner uh, yet 
same type of experience for those people that still want a snowmobile. I think that uh, snowmobilers are are wise people. I think people they uh, they understand that uh, things are changing, technology is changing, and to continue on in the sport that we truly love, we might have to look at it a little different way. And by being able to adapt to different types of power delivery or power trains or how we how we get around is uh, not so much the uh, the end result it's the uh, the idea that we've been able to save the sports because there's if you'll remember back um in the early early late 1998 99 2000s arctic cat uh, was kicked out of the personal watercraft business because lakes didn't like them anymore polaris got out of the business uh, there were several other small upshoots that tried to get into the personal watercraft business because it was, it was kind of one of those things that uh, was easy to get into. Uh, they were loud, they were obnox obnoxious, and people didn't particularly care for them on their lakes. And so people wrote rules to keep them from being able to participate and having fun on their lakes. We believe that there could be some of that that could happen in a snowmobile industry. And so we, we believe that uh, by taking the right steps, we'll be able to... Uh, mitigate some of the uh, legislation that could come about. Now, I don't know any of that to be true or false. That's just Doug's opinion, but uh, I think it's always a good step to uh, to show that we are uh, outdoorsmen. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to be environmentalists. I think snowmobilers are more outdoorsmen. They like to take care of their their land. They like to take care of their hunting areas and they're respectful of, of other people's lands so that they can continue to ride. So. That's my commentary, Gary. I won't say any more. I, I don't want to well, get in trouble. It, you, it, no, it makes sense to me. Like, how how do you see it minimizes the impact on wildlife and basically the ecosystem out there uh, having an electric snowmobile? Well, you you've removed a lot of the, well, say the the uh, the the sound factor, the the roar factor. You know, everybody. I, I, to this day, I still like to hear a good two-stroke with a with a set of pipes on it, just making a sound going up the hill. But uh, in the reality of things, if we don't start uh, doing some mitigation of some of that, we're going to lose it completely. And uh, by not having to worry about the uh, the wildlife uh, trying to bolt or run or injure themselves out there in the deep snow or whatever it might be running on trails, I think is a good thing and will be looked upon more as the, the conservative outdoorsman people that we truly are. Yeah. And you know what the, the, uh, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head right there because, uh, with, with, you know, OFSC will tell you that, two reasons trails close. One is trespassing, not going off trail. The second one, and I believe it might be the really the first, is loud, the noise, excessive noise levels. And especially now that the urban centers are growing so rapidly, noise is even more of a problem. I mean, they, they say about cans on sleds, but if you ever hear an unpiped sled, like just stock sled at night, you can hear it for miles. So if you have a taiga, you wouldn't hear anything. You know, we got to, I got to take care of some house cleaning here. We got a super chat from Jacob Massart, $9.99. He said, should have the first round bot at the lodge soon. Hypothetically, you could put wheels on the front of the, the Taiga and go get some coffee in the summer. <laughs> and uh, DP rocks, he, he did it on his 850. And he said, you don't need an electric sled for that. <laughs> But you know what, Drew? We wouldn't have had to worry about overheating at all if we had a taiga. <laughs> Anyone hasn't checked that video out, just look up No Snow Coffee Run. And uh, we take the uh, the Renegade XRS with some Koala Pieces roller skis and go get ourselves some coffees on it. So it was a fun shoot and a fun ride. I can see the taiga being the next in line to pull that stunt. That's for sure. Now, th this photo here shows uh, different color options. Uh, you got red, white, and blue. Are those available on your site now, or is it uh, like most of the stuff I see is white? Yeah, the majority, our Nomad is white. The other sleds that you see here, those are early photos of some prototypes that we had. Okay, cool. I think that uh, color options would be amazing. And I mean, it, it kind of looks like a segment thing, right? Um, 
Some of them have no windshields, and then you've got the one in the, the beside there, the white one with the windshield. Is it removable if you didn't, if you bought that? Uh... Uh, as I as I re uh, mentioned there, Jerry or Gary, I'm sorry. Those are um, all prototype units that uh, you've got a picture of there. Yeah. Okay. So they're in various yeah, states of uh, development and um, testing. Yeah. Right on. Right on. And there's another uh, shot of the of a uh, guy doing a snow wheelie or a jump or whatever up in the mountains. So uh, in deep snow, have you ridden one, Doug, in deep snow? I have. It's um, it's a snowmobile. It uh, you know you you can do you can do one of two things in deep snow with a snowmobile. You can either get yourself out or you can get stuck. And I've done both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true right and here's the gauge on the on the uh on the snowmobile here um exact like we said it's exactly the same as a watercraft that might actually be a better shot of it yeah and as you see the the date is uh is quite ancient uh this gauge has gone through some transformations that has uh provided uh much more clarity and, and a lot more information Oh, wow. That's, that's funny. Yeah. March 1st, 2020. There's even a satellite link there. So is it a, is that for your Wi-Fi updates? Uh, yes. So you push those out. Is there any owner, um, is there any There's user involvement? Like, okay. There's so the owner does have to download the, the latest, uh, update. Like it's not something that you push it through and the owner doesn't have to do anything to to get the the, uh, the owners the notified that there's going to be a push just like uh, what Tesla does. Yeah, nice. Nice. Very cool. And there it is uh, there it is with the headlights on in the factory. That that's uh it's such a good looking sled. I actually like it Doug without a windshield. I'm not much of a windshield guy. I I like the little bikini windshield on my uh the blade on the XRS. Uh I think that looks great. And then this is uh, three three of them lined up at Chargers here. What do you think about that shot? Well, this is one of our uh, charging spots that we uh, we used uh, during the winter testing and, and some of our long distance riding. It was along the way, and these are both uh, level two um, and um, DCFC. Yeah, great. And is this in Quebec, like on the trail, or where was this? It is, uh, it's not too far from Mount Treblanc, um, and it is off, it is on the trail. Uh, you don't have to drive on the road to get to it. You can drive, make the road crossing and then drive right to it. Oh, that's it's in a parking cool. lot for people to charge their cars as well, but it's, it's not like you've got to drive across uh, a parking lot at a grocery store or something. Or, or way down a road or yeah, yeah, that's, uh, right. it's easy to access. Very cool. And then this is a shot. It says announcing a production milestone with the Orca. Can you talk a bit about what that milestone was? That was this year, I think, too. Well, we we were able to uh, cumulatively build a thousand units in our factory there in La Salle, uh, which uh, was uh, accomplished by the uh, the building of the Orca Performance. Uh, we're on our way to build a thousand units, um, as Sam uh, stated today in our third quarter uh, report uh, for this year. Uh, so we've, we've made a lot of, uh, a lot of inroads and we've, uh, we've made a lot of headway in our uh, manufacturing, uh, capabilities. Very cool. That, that styling of the, uh, the Orca is pretty, uh, is pretty sexy. I'll tell you, it's a very nice design. So pat on the back to you guys, your design team there. Yeah, they did a very nice uh, job. Yeah. Doug, I see a small snow flap. I'm assuming you're just recycling snow for side lubrication. Uh, there's been a change made to the snow flap that you've seen in, in probably this particular uh, photo. Uh, not that you can see the uh, the snow flap. In fact, um, we've we've made some changes, but uh, for the for the most part, uh, we uh, we have good uh, lubrication and uh, cooling. We do have an under uh, tunnel. Uh, cooler for our thermal system. Okay. 
So you, your thermal system, like uh, like with my M300 drone, it'll actually heat the batteries up on a cold day to to make it dry to drive. Yours has heat and cooling, does it? We just do heat, and then the cooling is uh, a part of the the recirculation system. Yeah, I guess there's no shortage of cooling in the winter time and snow. No. Uh, Outdoor Hobby Guy says, where would you say the most interest is coming from in terms of buyer? Like which country, as in percentages, he's, he's asking. I don't know what that's about, but uh, is that is that something you can talk about? Um, you know, we, we have a lot of interest uh, in, pre- predominantly here in North America. Uh, for sure that there's uh, European uh, entities that would like to um, to see the sled come over there uh, in Sweden. Uh, is is a very uh, popular uh, area uh, from there. Sweden would like to uh, ban all gas things, I think. So um, we get we get a lot of interest from uh, all over the world. Nice, nice. The uh, yeah, that's cool. Another shot of the orca. Really neat. I like how the seats actually uh, cantilevered there. It's pretty cool. What do you think the biggest hurdle is when you when you talk about um, you know uh, selling on a global stage like this? What do you think the biggest hurdle is people have to get over um, when going into something electrified in power sports like this? I think it's uh, not any different than uh, when uh, Milwaukee Tool brought the first uh, set of cordless uh, power tools out and tried to convince the construction world that they needed to continue to keep the uh, to remove the cord and uh, rely on these uh, handheld tools that uh, just use a battery yeah, that's right I, I imagine there is some uh, some kickback on that right at the start there's a good shot of the front of the orca it's I think that's sexy it's gorgeous it's clean lines nice and it's yeah, and it's got nice lines to it. And here it is charging at the dock. I, how do you, would that be plugged into a boathouse or how do you see that? It could be charged, it could be plugged into a boathouse. It could be plugged in at the uh, dock side. It's wherever you can, uh, wherever you find yourself um, wanting to put your charging station. Could you run it off of a gas generator to charge it? If you had to, uh, if you had yeah. a gas generator that was big enough, that would run a, a 220 uh, outlet. That, we don't that's recommend the key, it. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, someone asked, I think it was Mike Leitz uh, way back in the chat. He said about, is there an option on the snowmobile to carry an extra battery? No, uh, with high voltage batteries, um, like what we use, hot swappable is not something that is, um, we're able to, uh accomplish at this time from a safety standpoint yeah yeah true and there there's the uh the this image is showing the orca with the with the charger plugged in it's like a flip up just like it is on on any other power sport that you're used to and you plug it in just like where you'd put the gas in is that the same way it is on the snowmobile as well yes essentially the same uh, type of cover that uh, you lift open and and you put the uh, charger in. Yeah. Is there any, like you're, there's a comment there about running 220 next to a lake. Is there any issues or is there safety features built into these chargers that you don't have to worry about having electricity near water or do you still have to air with caution? Well, I, I think that, uh, common sense would tell you that you don't uh, want to dunk your end of your charger in the lake. However, the uh, the system is set up so that it, it does have a communication loop that does not allow energy to start flowing until all the systems are uh, ready to uh, start accepting charge. Ah, uh, so it won't have any charge to it until you actually plug it into the receptacle on the vehicle. That's correct. Very smart. So you could actually throw that in the lake and not really have to worry about your kids swimming next to it getting electrified. I would always uh, err on the side of, of uh, yeah. caution and <laughs> keep my plug out of the water. 
That's right. <laughs> well, it's good to know. And that's a good, like, these are comments, but it's good question. It, it, it begs some thought and, you know, I, you wouldn't have ever thought of that, that safety being built in, you know, just like if you're charging it and your snowmobile, I mean, there's no water, but you think it's funny to stick it to your buddy's back to wake him up. Um, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work out. It, it wouldn't do anything. Exactly. Yeah. Now th th this shows a, a girl whipping it around. It looks like she had just done a complete 360 on the Orca. Are they pretty, are they pretty agile as agile as all the other uh, watercraft out there that we know of? I would say that the, the Orca is, um, is as agile as any sport performance, uh, personal watercraft out there. In fact, it, um, it has a very sharp line to it. it. It'll provide a very aggressive ride and it will also uh, provide a very comfortable, uh, what I'll call a pleasure ride as well. And is that by using the modes? So if you, like, if you wanted your, your, you know, a, a new rider to, to ride it or your, your, you know, 16 year old kid to ride it. I mean, that's the age limit here in Canada. Would, could you set it on a on a gentler mode, like a learning mode? Well, we have the the range mode, the performance mode, and the wild mode, and and you could set it on the range mode, and it it does limit it to uh, a certain uh, kilometer per hour, and I and I can't remember exactly, but it's uh, you know it's like it's it's not aggressive, and so um, I wouldn't we don't consider it uh, those those type of modes that other people might have with the learning and those kind of things. We just we set them as range performance in wild. Yeah. Yeah. Wild sounds like a fun ride. That's for sure. <laughs> it is. Here, I'm just going to get us back to normal sizes, but that's the pictures I had, uh, I had pulled in there. Now you had sent me a couple more, but I didn't get them pushed over. Let me just see. Was it something you want me to, to no, bring them over? No, no, it's good. And we, we covered it all off. We've got okay. it covered. No, that's great. Well, that's cool. We talked about maintenance. I'm just going through a list of some thoughts that I had. Uh, we talked about parts availability. Um, you know, where, where do you see as far as the future of, of Tyga goes? Are you... I know you can't talk a lot about it, but do you see Tyga being, when you mentioned power sports, getting into some other areas, not snow and water? Well, I think it's um, it's fairly safe to say that uh, our CEO has um, talked about uh, different power sports uh, understandings and, and just taking a look at what's out there that uh, what's next in line to be electrified. So, um, sure. We're, we're not any different Very, than any of the other manufacturers out there. Very cool. Well, it sounds like a very progressive company. And, um, like I said, it's the small, it seems like a small company, a big company with some small thinking roots, you know, as far as being able to act, uh, fast on latest trends and that type of thing. Yeah. That we are. Yeah, very cool. Well, I, I don't know if you had anything else to add uh, to the conversation. I think I've I've kind of exhausted everything I needed to know and then some. Uh, well, Gary, I just want to thank you very much for allowing me to have some time on your on your program to share uh, about Taiga. Uh, I think that uh, as people uh, start uh, investigating and, and exploring more about what Tyga is all about and and the products that we have and and it, yes it's uh, it's limited right now to a, a utility sled and to our, our two different uh, levels of uh, personal watercraft uh, there's more to come and uh, we believe that uh, for sure um, our we're not any different than anyone else we're uh, we're we're building vehicles that go have fun on to enjoy to uh, bring your family along and to uh, to grow the sport and as as we do that uh, we believe that uh, our powertrain and our philosophy on on a clean application is uh, right for the environment and it's right for uh, it's right for our sport 
Yeah, right on. Corey Brock says, very informative. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Odie is sliding car guy. Says, great show. Very informative. Uh, Mike Leitz says, cool show, guys. We'll see you next week. And outdoor, guys, thanks, Doug, for your time. It's great. I really appreciate it. How do people follow Tyga? Let's go through your social media. Um, you're on Instagram. You're on Facebook. You've got the website. We talked about tigamotors.com. Do you know what the Instagram and Facebook handles are? No. If you'll see, uh, Gary, look real close. There's just a little gray hair here, and I'm doing really good just getting my phone program to call my wife. So um, I, I'm, uh, I know that uh, every, we're out there on Facebook, Instagram, X, uh, LinkedIn, and, and also our website. And our website takes you to all those different areas. And so I think the, the fastest way to find anything about Tyga is just uh, – uh, tigamotors.com and, and you'll find everything that you need to. Yeah. And it's not hard to search in any of the social channels that you're involved in and, and find them. Even TikTok, they've, they've got a channel there. Um, appreciate the effort and quickly changing times. Uh, thank you, Gary and Doug. Great show. Uh, thanks for pushing the sport. Jacob Massert says, you know, these guys are gas heads too. And, I know. You know this I, is I can tell. Nice I can tell. See. And uh, <laughs> I, I really do appreciate the uh, the opportunity to, to be able to share everything about Tyga. And no, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, well, that's great. I appreciate your time. I won't keep you forever. Hang out afterwards in the green room. I with the recording has to finish looping here. And then uh, we can chit chat a little bit off off screen. And away we go. But thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight and commenting and asking such great questions. And uh, we will see you guys all next week. Have a great night. It's a journey.